Hi, I'm Mally Schatzfeld, Managing Editor of Endodonta Practice US, a Medmark publication. Today we are going to talk to Dr. Tyler Baker and discover how to achieve maximum root canal disinfection through a minimally invasive protocol. Dr. Baker will share clinical cases using the gentle wave system and show us the benefits of using this technology. Before we get started, I would like to invite viewers to use the question box in your control panel to ask any questions that you have, and those will be answered at the end of our session. I would like to introduce Dr. Tyler Baker and give a quick summary of his credentials. Dr. Tyler Baker received his DDS degree from Loma Linda University. He received an AEGD certificate and other awards while serving as a dentist in the United States Air Force. He returned to Loma Linda University where he received a certificate in endodontics and a master's degree. He's been published in the Journal of Endodontics and other publications. He currently practices endodontics in San Marcos, California where he runs the North County Seattle Study Club and he was voted one of San Diego Magazine's top dentists. We now welcome Dr. Baker to begin his presentation. Very good, thank you, Mally, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, attending our webinar this afternoon. I think uh, it's very exciting uh, new technology we have to present, and I'm not sure how familiar everyone with, is with it, but I expect uh, you will become more and more familiar with it with time. So today, uh, plan to uh, just kind of give uh, more of an introduction and uh, uh, overview of kind of the technology and uh, you know the benefits that it uh, can provide for uh, the endodontic practice. So um, here's a little bit about me and my office. Uh, I'm located in San Marcos again and it's basically North County San Diego. Um, uh, some views of my office. Uh, I spend about 12 hours a day here it seems so I kind of feel you know, I want to make a comfortable environment someplace, you know, I really want to enjoy working and uh, probably like a lot of you if you're tuning in, most of you are probably, you know, sort of tech guys, you're into something new, something that, you know, to add to your practice, keep you up to date, something that's fun and that's kind of, you know, that's what keeps me going every day is uh, finding something that's new and fun for my practice, something that's going to benefit the patient. Um, uh, to this point, I've uh, done quite a few uh, gentle wave cases. I've uh, started using it, uh, you know, close to a year and a half ago, and um, uh, probably done about as many as anyone. And uh, here's kind of me using it in the office on the left. Uh, you can kind of see the gentle wave uh, device in the background. And then you can see uh, their instrument head being used uh, on a patient, and uh, you can see it's very unassuming, uh, you know looks uh, you know, pretty straightforward, not something uh, real scary to the patient. Uh, now to go over uh, you know, really the intricate uh, details of uh, the device, uh, we have Bob Guyette, uh, the Vice President of Sunendo, who's going to present a little more detailed information on the inner workings of uh, the general way of device. Thank you, Dr. Baker. I'd like to take a few minutes to review the gentle wave system. I think it'll provide some context within which to appreciate the clinical cases that you're about to see. So the gentle wave system is comprised of an operating system and a treatment instrument. And on the screen you can see the console which houses the operating system and then on the right hand side of the console you can see the holder which houses the treatment instrument. So for a thorough deep dive analysis on the mechanism of action, I'd urge you to visit Sinendo.com. For the purposes of today's webinar, there's a couple of key areas I want to highlight. So let's start at looking at the primary role of the operating system, which is the ability to optimize treatment fluids. So here we see the storage area where the treatment fluids are contained, the sodium hypochlorite, EDTA, and distilled water. And the operating system is constantly measuring and adjusting the concentration levels of these treatment fluids to ensure maximum disinfection of the uh, intracanal structure. The other area, the other way rather, that we maximize or optimize treatment fluids is through these three cylinders that you see in the screen. So we're looking at a cross section of the gentle wave console, and these three cylinders serve to extract all of the gases from the treatment fluids. So how is this done? Why is it important? Well, let's start with the how. The how is through a process called degassing, which is simply a process of removing gases that will benefit 
any process where gases can negatively impact the desired outcome. Now, why is this important? It's because we know that gases in conventional root canal therapy manifest often as vapor lock in the apical third, where the vapor lock prevents the disinfecting fluids, the treatment fluids, from reaching the apical third. We also see it in the coronal and middle third, where the gases that are contained in air bubbles in the canal end up insulating the bacteria from the treatment fluids. And the end result is an unacceptable level of canal cleaning with conventional root canal therapy. And so with the gentle wave system, the ability to optimize treatment fluids by completely degassing them works as part of the broader mechanism of action that's delivered through the treatment instrument. So the treatment instrument takes the degas fluid and it applies multisonic energy. And this multisonic energy then is submitted through the very uh, complex anatomy contained within a, a, a tooth and it's able to identify the natural frequency of the complex tooth structures contained within. So the degas fluid working in synchronicity with the multisonic energy completely debride the intracanal tooth structure, disinfect the tooth structure and in, including deep into micro uh, tubules, dental tubules, and it also does this without requiring any removal of precious intracanal tooth structure. So let's take a look at how that manifests. So here we have a cross-section of calcium spheroids. This is dentin in its native state, and we can see cleaning with the gentle wave system, and this is an area that's never been touched by files. So we are able to maintain preoperative tooth morphology. Clinicians are able to use files as small as a 1504, if they desire. And we're seeing patients that, that, that are not having much post-op pain, and we're seeing fast healing. Here's a 2,000x magnification, and here's a 20,000x magnification, where we see tubules inside tubules. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Baker. Great. Thank you, Bob. Uh, yeah, it's kind of those areas where uh, it, a new technology, it's very important for the user to know exactly what it is uh, we're doing. And so I'm going to kind of show, uh, I guess, the effective uh, portion or the treatment sort of head of uh, the general wave device. And uh, um, basically uh, what we have is a sealing cap that sits over the top of the tooth, uh, basically making a closed system for uh, the general wave to work. And then what happens is uh, our treatment solutions travel down this tube and hit a concave plate at the end of uh, the tube and uh, in effect produce uh, what is called a cavitation uh, cloud. And uh, this cavitation cloud produces little cavitation uh, bubbles that, um, that implode and in the process produce little uh, micro vortices of different wavelengths of energy that travel down the canal. And this uh, energy uh, works to effectively break up debris, uh, vital tissue, necrotic tissue, and biofilm, and uh, remove it from the canal. Uh, again, what's important to note that uh, Bob uh, showed in the um, mechanism of uh, the gentle wave is that, one, the solutions are all degassed. If uh, you've seen uh, uh, microscopic views of, uh, of irrigating uh, devices uh, cleaning these small channels, uh, what they have found in their studies is, again, uh, the little bubbles in the canals serve as almost pillows where, uh, you know, these energy waves traveling down the canal, you know, will hit a, one of these pillows or bubbles and uh, effectively uh, reduces that uh, energy wave from propagating down the canal. So if we can eliminate those uh, gas bubbles by degassing the solutions, it makes uh, those energy waves much more effective. Uh, likewise, these uh, solutions aren't just injected straight down the canal where they can potentially uh, uh, drive solution out into the apical tissues. That uh, The whole time uh, this uh, solution is being evacuated from the system, so you get uh, basically in, uh, energy waves uh, traveling down the canal, but uh, the solution's effectively uh, constantly being uh, pulled from the uh, canal system so that it's a very safe and effective uh, mechanism of action. Now, at the AE, we'll uh, be going through some of these in 
much more detail, but this, I feel, is a good overview to understand uh, what it is we're doing with the, the General Wave device. Now, uh, I'm going to move forward. Uh, let me get rid of uh, my little pen here. And uh, so here are some uh, classic uh, cleared teeth that have been injected with dye to show the complex anatomy of a tooth. And, uh, you know, these are some of the first uh, you know, studies that uh, we've done to uh, illustrate the complex anatomy of a tooth. Now, uh, we've kind of gotten into micro CT scans, which are awesome for us to, uh, you know, more thoroughly uh, visualize the complex anatomy of a root canal system. But what this also illustrates is what I feel uh, is the ideal root canal. Really, uh, if you uh, see, uh, I'm going to grab my, I guess you can, let me grab my pen again just to uh, show what it is we're trying to illustrate here. Uh, basically, an ideal root canal consists of a very small access opening, and then if we could effectively clean out the full canal system, debride it of all tissue and bacteria, and basically inject our uh, filling material down the roots, filling the chamber, basically leaving it the anatomy of the tooth, all the dentin the same, while effectively fully sealing the canal system, that would be an ideal root canal. And so moving forward, you know, this is our goal in root canal treatment, but I feel like we've kind of hit an impasse um, when it comes to uh, our root canal treatments. We've kind of come to a point where this is kind of the standard of care. Now, how did these uh, look in any way similar? It, you know, they don't, but I mean, there is rationale as to why we do things the way we do, but I feel we've kind of hit an impasse. Again, we're uh, basically doing things the same way we did uh, 60 years ago or whenever, uh, you know, or even a hundred years ago when root canals were initially uh, started, basically we're still using an instrument to auger down the center of the canal, removing dentin and filling it with a filling substance. These days, you know, we have quicker methods of doing it with nitide files, but it's basically uh, the same system and then we're basically, uh, you know, uh, filling with a cone of gutta percha. So, you know, you see one of these uh, uh, root canals, and this was done by someone who uh, was probably very skilled. And what's interesting is that this is a case that I happened to uh, even treat this morning where their their root canal looks very nice on the x-ray, but there's an apical lesion, and these kind of treatments still fail today. Um, here's an interesting study that uh, Paik did in 2009. And uh, on the left in uh, image A, you can see the natural uh, complex anatomy of a mesial root of a lower molar. Now in uh, figure B, you see the instrumentation pattern of a protaper F3. Now this could be any instrument, you know, not just a protaper. This is the natural instrumentation pattern that we get. Now, uh, if you place them over each other, you can see the instrumentation pattern uh, misses two apical foramen and a large fin. Now, we instrument this large because we're th uh, the goal is to get our irrigants down to the apex effectively. Now what's interesting about this study is the process of instrumenting filled all these uh, fins and uh, lateral canals and uh, ramifications with debris. Now uh, once we irrigated, the study showed that uh, only 50% of that debris is filled. And you know, common sense would make you think, okay, if I instrument to a 3006, in some cases, you know, we're instrumenting size 50 and larger, you know, to effectively clean the canal. If that's the case, we should be seeing tons of uh, lateral canals because we are just flushing it so much more effectively. But what's interesting is we tend to see you know, the exact opposite. You know, the more we instrument, it's interesting that the less anatomy I tend to see in my practice. And so I'm going to illustrate some cases today. I feel uh, kind of drive home a little bit more of what we're trying to do. I feel it gets us back more to uh, that image on the left where uh, we're conserving and preserving the natural anatomy while more effectively cleaning the tooth. And I'm going to start by, again, today I'm going to show the straightforward cases, the ones that should be just a walk in the park. You know, you're thinking, hey, there's a slam dunk, there's a 20 minute molar, there's money in the bank. And what's interesting is, You've all had cases where, you know, 
you had one patient, complex curved canals, calcified canals, you know, you pulled the heroic move, you uh, instrumented the canal, it turned out beautiful, and then you had the case like this, you instrumented it, and for whatever reason, this patient came back, they had the apical lesion they returned, they had the continued symptoms, and you're thinking, now nah, I did that complex one, why did this easy one come back and fail on me? And uh, this was an 18-year-old boy who uh, was seen by one of my referring docs. Uh, patient came in in pain, uh, the referring doctor removed the, the occlusal decay, did a pulpotomy, and uh, sent him over for me to treat him the next day. Now, if you look at the root canal system on this, this, again, looks pretty straightforward. Now, uh, what would most of you instrument uh, this root canal to? I'm going to guess your, the distal canal you're going to, I would see on average anywhere from a 30 to a 50.06 uh, instrumentation pattern. And in the mesial canal, eh, maybe a 25.06. You know, some of you may take a little bit smaller, but on average is... Uh, we were taught, you know, to effectively irrigate the canal, you know, based on the Cotomy study in 2006. Most of you would uh, instrument to uh, 3006 to make sure you're properly instrumenting this. Well, this is one I actually instrumented to a size 1504 in every canal. Now, I think uh, most of you think, well, that's kind of crazy. Why would you do that? And it's because of that last study that we uh, saw, in, in which case, um, this anatomy can be very complex, and so over-instrumenting the canal can actually uh, block you out of a lot of these fins. And if we use a smaller instrument to uh, brush and work our way into the uh, main areas of the canal without uh, effectively taking away uh, over-instrumenting the canal, basically what we're trying to do is preserve the natural dentition while removing the debris. But uh, if we over-instrument, we're going to pack a lot of that debris into the eccentricities, and uh, our irrigation patterns are going to be less effective. So what we're getting to is multiple apical foramen, while, which looks a lot more like image A versus image B, where we would uh, have, in general, one large cone in the distal root and two large cones in the mesial root. And a lot of times, those little uh, apical ramifications and fins would be unfilled. I'm going to move on to the next case here. And again, this is another uh, fairly straightforward run-of-the-mill case where a uh, patient presented with irreversible pulpitis. Now, uh, uh, the canal system is fairly straight, maybe a little more constricted than average. Um, and uh, I'm going to jump forward to what I did in this case. Uh, basically, um, uh, starting at the top of the canal, uh, maybe a little larger access than what I would like to see uh, in, on average. Some of, for some of you, this may be bigger. For others of you, this may be smaller than what you do on average. Uh, for me, I made it this size uh, so I could effectively um, remove that uh, pulp stone from the pulp chamber. But if you see the image on the right, we've still preserved the natural uh, pulp chamber size. We've uh, pretty much kept the anatomy exactly the same. Now, if we uh, zoom in on it a bit, We've still effectively fully cleaned the canal. We've cleaned the webbing in the mesial canal. We've effectively cleaned a lateral canal, and we found multiple apical foramen. Now, for most of us, in order to fill this kind of anatomy, what would we do? We would instrument the canals, and then, in general, we would place calcium hydroxide in order to give uh, the, our irrigants or our cleaning uh, um, medicaments, more time to uh, work and break down that tissue. Some of you would uh, let the sodium hypochloride uh, sit for 30 minutes. Well, this is one, again, where we did very minimal instrumentation technique, but with the general way, we were able to effectively irrigate and debride and clean the canals. And, uh, you know, again, there's those out there that uh, feel that small shapes can't be filled effectively. Well, they can. It basically using similar principles to what we already use, we can effectively three-dimensionally fill the full canal system while maintaining the original canal uh, anatomy. And uh, I feel this is going to be a much stronger op uh, stronger and much long more of a long-term option uh, for the patient over what we're already doing. Um, now I'm going to move on to uh, a case of mine. This is a case 
that I did uh, about six months prior to uh, uh, using the gentle wave. And uh, this was an upper uh, molar number 14, uh, not number 13. I uh, uh, hope I'm not that bad on some days. But uh, um, number 14, uh, basically what we did here is we instrumented four canals. The MB1 and MB2 canals kind of joined at the apex. We uh, medicated it with calcium hydroxide, uh, had the patient back. We irrigated copiously. We used the endoactivator to ag agitate and uh, uh, effect more effectively uh, clean uh, the canal system. But patient returned to my office about nine months later, uh, and I believe all of you can relate to this situation again, where patient came in, I tap on it, it doesn't feel right, and there were, she was even more specific, where she said, hey, if, if I bite on the mesial buccal uh, cusp of this tooth, you know, it doesn't feel right. I can tell it doesn't feel right. Darn, you know, this is one of those where, you know, what's going on? You know, looks good. You know, we filled the, to the terminuses. You know, what did I do wrong here? And this is kind of one of those where, you know, uh, those on the other side of the uh, table doing implants would say, hey, these are the ones where uh, root canals don't work. Have you, you know, they love to ask the audience, uh, you know, how many of you ever had a root canal? How many of you uh, can say it hasn't felt quite right? Well, this is one of those. And if this patient happened to see a periodontist or someone else, and you know, not that it's a periodontist, but, you know, someone else uh, that's pushing more of an implant-based practice, they may say, hey, you know, this is the best uh, root canal that uh, endodontics has to offer, you know. Really, if you want this to work, you should take it out and do an implant. And what's What's an interesting uh, study that just came out of Toronto and uh, um, showed uh, you know there's a couple preferences. Number one thing that patients want is to be informed of all the treatment options. So you know, definitely want to inform them of hey you know we could take this tooth out and do an implant. But likewise, the number two thing that patients are looking for is they want to save their natural teeth. So we want to do everything we can uh, to ideally save that tooth. You know people have an emotional bond. And it's not until uh, something breaks that bond, uh, you know, failed root canals, a history of failures, you know, someone, uh, you know, pushing more of the implant scheme and things that uh, people get dissuaded away from the tooth. So anyway, moving on, uh, this tooth patient was symptomatic. So these days, you know, what are we going to do? We're going to take a comb beam. And if we look at that mesial buccal root, we're seeing a small radiolucency in that area and what looks to be a little apical bifurcation. And, uh, you know, I've seen these a fair number of times, as I'm sure uh, some of you out there have. And what's great about the comb beam is you can measure right down to that bifurcation, and a lot of times you can find your way into it to instrument. But this was a case I went back in to uh, re-instrument the canal. I just could not get into it. it was just that lateral canal, it was just not uh, happening. So, you know, we went in irrigated with the general wave, and what did we find? We found uh, a lateral canal in that area that um, we weren't able to uh, pick up no matter medicating the canal, no matter how long I irrigated with the solutions, uh, we weren't able to uh, find it. And so uh, we, uh, after this, the patient's symptoms subsided. It's amazing how one of these little lateral canals is the difference between patient being fully functional in a quadrant versus uh, not functional at all. And, uh, you know, some people don't get real excited about lateral canals. They, they don't think it's important. But this is something that I do see as a, a continuing uh, symptom that patients uh, come back with. And this is the kind of thing that gets uh, bad press. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the patient that comes in and says, hey, root canals, uh, cause cancer, root canals, uh, leave bacteria in my mouth. I don't want bacteria in my, my mouth, I want implant. Well, you know, this is something, since I've used the gentle wave, that actually happens uh, quite frequently. I don't want to be the one that shows my one case where I picked up a lateral canal. This happens uh, all the time. When I first uh, started using the gentle wave, all of a sudden I started picking up these little lateral canals in the mesial, these little apical bifurcations. I started to wonder, is this something I need to uh, be looking for on a daily basis? You know, after I find that uh, small MD2, do I now need to be uh, putting little bends on my files and finding my way 
into these little uh, apical bifurcations. And how are you going to predictably find that? You just can't. And so basically, we need a more effective way to uh, clean the tooth. And that's where we're at. We're uh, looking for ways to preserve the natural uh, shape and anatomy of the tooth, the full tooth structure of the tooth, while more effectively cleaning the full canal system. And so, um, you know, in, in conclusion, uh, basically, uh, this is uh, more holistic, this is more natural, this is something that patients can relate to. It's uh, preserving the full uh, uh, dentition of the tooth, the full uh, tooth structure. This is uh, minimally invasive. This, uh, while we're still cleaning the multiple eccentricities of the canal. And, you know, something I think about when I'm working on a tooth is, you know, really the true test of a man's character is what he does when no one is watching it. Endodox is very easy to do a, uh, a very basic job on, and no one will know the difference. You can easily fill three canals, the stuff it with a cone of gutta percha, and a lot of people would not know the difference between that and this. Uh, but what, what it uh, does uh, show is the test of time. And uh, patients know when it doesn't feel right, they know when they have to return for a redo. And the referring doctor knows when it fails because when they put the crown on and it's not feeling right, they're going to send it back to you and they're going to tell you that that uh, tooth's failing because of your endo. And uh, I feel uh, this is something that you know needs to be uh, uh, addressed and we need to take that next step towards uh, uh, moving endodontics in a different direction. And so this is something that we're going to stress a little more uh, at the at the AE convention, the General Wave, this is kind of their passion and what they're uh, looking to uh, achieve. And that this is just uh, kind of hitting the surface of uh, what we're doing. And I and I hope you'll uh, join us for future sessions of either these webinars or uh, meetings at the AE because uh, really we are pushing endodontics in a different direction. And it's fun and it's exciting uh, because uh, we can see it in the patients when they return that we're doing something that is going to last and they're going to be uh, much more comfortable because of it. So I'm going to turn it over to Mally again uh, if there's any questions uh, uh, in particular that people want to ask. Yes, I would like to remind people that uh, you can ask any questions now in your, in your question, um, on your question box in your control panel. Um, but I do have a question. Thank you so much for that informational presentation. I, I really enjoyed it, and I know our viewers are too. My first question is, why did you incorporate gentle wave into your practice? You know, for me, I, you know, again at the beginning, I kind of stressed that I, I am into new kind of fun stuff to keep the practice exciting. But um, before I incorporated, I, you know, I, I well, what's interesting is uh, we're getting into the, a lot of people are getting into the minimally invasive instrumentation technique. And uh, I think it's fantastic. Uh, but what we need along with it are more effective uh, cleaning techniques to go along with it. And you know, I, I noticed we're still lacking in some our, of our debridement techniques. And I was, you know, even thinking of buying a used laser, you know, a lot of the studies out there show that, you know, uh, some of these other uh, cleaning uh, methods aren't a bit as effective, but you know I was still uh, looking for something new that would be more effective in debriding and cleaning the canal system. And it just so happened that at the same time I was looking, General Wave and Sun Endo's company happened to be close by, and it happened to be something I uh, was looking into. And after looking into the technology. Uh, it just sort of made sense to me, and uh, it's something that's developing, and I'm sure a lot of uh, endodontists, or endodontists are like me out there who, uh, you know, they're skeptical of new techniques, and it takes a lot uh, for you to change and make that next step into something new. And uh, for me, after playing with it and trying and, uh, you know, uh, looking at extracted teeth, it, it's something that all of a sudden, uh, you know, it, it really did uh, hit home that I'm doing something better, new, something that, uh, that is going to improve the outcomes in my office. And so, you know, that's kind of where it came uh, in my personal situation. Um, so, as a result, do you feel that you are now providing a more efficacious root canal treatment? 
Yeah, exactly, and uh, that probably goes along with my last treatment. But uh, one uh, one uh, note uh, to go along with a more efficacious treatment is, you know, sometimes people think that uh, you know a, a new irrigation method will be uh, uh, much more um, traumatic to the to the tissues around the tooth, and so the thought initially is, hey, this is going to cause more post-op pain, and uh, you see it in your uh, referring offices where they say uh, you've had you get a few of those questions. Hey, uh, you know this patient has post-op pain. Was it because I irrigated too much with bleach? And you know usually it's the opposite. It's because you didn't uh, irrigate enough with bleach. And uh, with the gentle wipe, um, because it so effectively debrides the area, I actually feel like I see a much less post-op sensitivity in vital cases as well as necrotic cases. I feel it uh, more effectively cleans and pulls the bacteria and toxins uh, from uh, the apical tissues and from the canal system that I am actually uh, seeing much less uh, post-op sensitivity, much more uh, comfortable patients afterwards. And so um, that's where I'm uh, seeing uh, most uh, improvement. Have, um, have, how have your referring GPs responded to General Wave, and has the number of your new referrals increased? Yeah, it, it, uh, um, the first part is the GPs and uh, referrals. Um, what's kind of interesting in the referral patterns is uh, the patients. Even uh, it, it's interesting uh, they they notice a difference. You know, they they see the less scary, the less traumatic a method in which uh, the root canal was performed. And uh, they note that uh, you know they have less discomfort, and they see in the end uh, how well the uh, the root canal went. And they they tell their friends even you know that uh, hey this was a better method. Um, I, I forgot the first part of that question again. If you don't mind. Uh, um, how, how, how have the referring GPs responded to the general wave? Um, and and you know the ones that uh, really matter are. Uh, the ones that do quality treatment, they're the ones that tend to notice the most. The, the guys that you know uh, spend the time uh, doing the quality crown preparation and restorative work, the ones that care, those are the ones that notice. And usually, those are your best referring docs. They know that um, you know the endodontists. Uh, that's what they do all day. They uh, they're gonna refer the patient for that, and they in return they see it coming back. They they look at the treatment reports, and so really I'd say I've noticed it in the quality referrals. Uh, you, they see the, the better result, and in turn, uh, you see a better referral pattern. So that's that's where I tend to see it. Um, how, how have your staff adapted to this technology? Uh, they think it's fun. You know, I, I it, it's uh, you know it's something new. Uh, you know, some offices, you know. Some staff, uh, they're going to see it as, oh, man, i got something else i got to deal with. But, but it's actually a, a fairly easy system to use. Uh, you know, with it uh, functioning in the cart, it's easy to just kind of plug and play, so to speak. You know, you just roll it into the next room, plug it in. It's got the touch screen, you know, so it's easy just to flip through it. And uh, it's all in kind of a self-contained device. So when it comes down to it, it's really not a complicated uh, issue for the staff to deal with. And again, uh, it's fun for them to kind of see a better result as well. I think you um, addressed some of this question. Are you saving more teeth with this technology? Yeah, I, I'd like to definitely say so, especially that last case. You know, that's kind of one where, you know, it may have ended up with an apico. Uh, that may have saved the day, but, uh, you know, we were able to preserve more tooth, uh, more uh, um, more minimally invasive, I feel it has a longer, uh, better long-term outcome. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, we are saving more teeth. Okay. Um, are you seeing faster healing? And if so, why do you think that is? Um, again, I, I, you know, the the old uh, saying is the reason uh, uh, infections persist is inadequate debridement, and uh, that's kind of what we see. Uh, with this is a better debridement of uh, the lesion, the canal system uh, should allow for uh, uh, much better healing. And you know some of the studies you know you, uh, you've seen the JOE and uh, 
and that will present a, a variety of quality uh, uh, clinicians, a variety of um, our uh, endodontic schools have uh, you know done some quality studies on the healing, and with time uh, uh, they'll be uh, uh, seen in the papers. I even sent them to when I first started uh, uh, visiting them. Uh, you could see the quality of the of the research they were doing. You know, randomized control uh, studies, just high quality studies that take a lot of money and take a lot of time, and so. I think uh, some of this is uh, something that's going to play out more in the future in uh, the studies, but uh, clinically, you know, having used it for a year, I don't have any specific data on that, but uh, at this point, uh, I can uh, see it is effective. Okay, we do have a question. Uh, somebody just said, nice cases, Doc, from all of these cases done with GenoWave. Did you prepare the root canals with NITI files first and obturate with Mastercone GP? Yeah, yes, uh, uh, NITI files, uh, the one uh, advancement I feel in uh, NITI files is the flexibility and our ability to uh, uh, instrument uh, with a much smaller size. And then um, with uh, that being said, uh, then we can kind of come back in with the general way. The old uh, uh, idea of doing a big access to uh, get our straight line access to the apical third, the, you know, the file companies have uh, greatly improved our ability to uh, instrument uh, without having to over instrument the tooth. And so that's kind of played right into the gentle wave and being able to uh, effectively clean those uh, tough to reach areas. And uh, um, yeah, I use uh, you know master cones in some cases. Um, it's, a, it's a variety of techniques, but you know it, it's basically uh, uh, some uh, gutta percha cones, some uh, uh, warm gutta percha techniques, and uh, uh, it, it's something that I feel is kind of a longer discussion for later because uh, it, I don't want to say too much that may get someone in trouble trying to, you know, uh, be overly, uh, uh, what's the word, just... Uh, overly aggressive in obturating uh, three-dimensionally, but there are consistent and predictable ways of three-dimensionally cleaning the, or fill, uh, filling uh, the canal system with gutta percha. So, but thank you very much. So, um, how, has, how has your filing protocol changed? Uh, it, it's much smaller. I, you know, I, I, for me, uh, the aha moment came uh, a few years ago. Uh, one of my GPs told me I, uh, I uh, did root canals like an endodontist. What does that mean? I do root canals. Is that a compliment or a dig or what is that? And uh, basically, he told me I, you know, make the big instrumentation in the canals. And I was kind of, you know, you're exactly right. You know, I I do uh, uh, feel like, you know, from what we were originally taught, everyone's natural inclination. Uh, when the first time you ever did a root canal in dental school. You probably did a super small access, and you were very proud of finding the canal through a small access and a small instrumentation. And then your instructor told you, "Hey, you need to open up this much bigger and instrument bigger." And so, you know, being told that by endodontists over and over, you start to buy into it. But um, really, uh, it, I feel like we kind of pushed uh, too far in that direction. And uh, what's great is uh, some of the new. Uh, instrumentation and obturation protocols really allow us to stay small. And so, um, you know, so a number of these cases were 1504, but uh, a variety of them, you know, I, I don't uh, advocate one file over another as long as it has um, a small diameter because, or it basically, I, I, I basically look to mimic the canal size. That's really what uh, my goal is. So, uh, you know, there's V tapers, there's a variety of uh, fantastic files that I feel a mimic. However, when you go to AE, you'll see a million different files, and quite a few of them are mimic of larger filing techniques and, uh, you know, one, uh, one file techniques. Well, you know, a lot of times I am doing a one uh, NITI file technique. But it's a very small file, and uh, you know, again, it's much less invasive, and it's preserving a lot more tooth structure, and uh, it's much more fun to uh, to see the final results. So, um, 
Again, a lot of these are kind of uh, deeper discussions for kind of another time, but that's kind of a short answer to probably something you're wanting to hear more information about. <laughs> We're getting a lot of questions in. Um, somebody said, great presentation. Have you noticed limitations or contraindications with the system, and how could this be used in practices with multiple offices? Um, you know, uh, uh, limitations, uh, at this point, it's limited to molars. Um, uh, you know, the, there's certain uh, cases where just kind of the orientation of the tooth, uh, um, you know, certain extenuating circumstances maybe don't lend itself ideally to it, although, you know, most molars you can use it to a greater or lesser extent. Um, uh, there's uh, there's going to be advancements along the way. Uh, so at this point, it is kind of a molar technique. But uh, you know, as far as uh, multiple uh, practice offices, I think it uh, because it is kind of more or less an eight-minute treatment time. Basically, uh, you're irrigating with uh, sodium hypochlorite for five minutes. Then it does a 30-second flush with uh, um, basically sterile water. Then you uh, irrigate another two minutes with EDTA and the final. 15-second uh, rinse with uh, sterile water. Basically, uh, after that eight minutes, you can easily unplug it, roll it to the next person in a multi-office practice. I can't imagine uh, uh, everyone can't use it in a multi-person office. And again, it probably needs to be uh, seen in practice, but you know, a two, three doctor office, I don't see that being a problem. Okay, um, we have somebody who entered the seminar late and was interested in, um, in finding out how the general way works. So I would like to say to that person, since we don't, we're coming to the end of our webinar, that we will be sending you a recording of this presentation so you'll get a chance to catch up um, when you see our recording. Um, uh, we did have a question about uh, price ranges. And um, so the answer to that question would be, please go to sonendo.com for more information or to email them directly at info at sonendo.com um, and you'll find some more information. I don't see any more questions right now, um, uh, but in uh, closing, uh, I wanted to thank you, um, Dr. Baker, for your wonderful and informative uh, webinar and I invite our viewers to visit www.channelwave.com and www.sonendo.com for more information. Um, Sonendo will be at the AAE in San Francisco April 6th through the 9th, so please sh be sure to visit them at booth number 317. That's booth number 317. In addition, Dr. Baker will be presenting at the AAE on April 6th at 1045, so you can meet him in person. And now uh, please download the attachment on your control panel for your reference. Um, again, thank you so much, Doctor, for, for the webinar. We thank our attendees for attending. We look forward to seeing everyone at the AAE. Dr. Baker, would you like to say goodbye to our viewers? Exactly. Uh, thank you, Molly. And uh, I'd like to, again, thank everyone for attending. And um, again, uh, there's uh, uh, much more to the general system, uh, general wave system, that uh, can be incorporated into the practice and the way we're doing things. And I, I feel it's really a new and exciting uh, change that we haven't really seen in the endodontics uh, um, almost since the beginning. You know, just a totally different way and approach to root canal treatment that I, I feel is really going to be exciting for the future. So again, I, I would like to stress people to come to the AE as well and come see our future uh, lectures because it's going to be a fun and exciting way of doing things. So thank you. Thank you.